you shall not pass. This video, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, that is. Because today, we're talking about the number one Dark Lord in Arda, and it isn't Sauron. No, today, we shall speak of his master, Morgoth, the evil Valar, who introduced Discord in the Song of Eru and was the progenitor of all evil in Middle-earth. But don't worry, we won't just tell you about Melkor, or Morgoth, as he later began to be called. No, we shall also share some unresolved mysteries that surround the Dark Lord. Anyway, Morgoth, or Melkor, as he was called before he fell to the dark side, what's his deal, you ask? Well, let's start at the making of creation, shall we? And the role Melkor, or Morgoth, played in that. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Melkor to Morgoth, the journey of a Valar gone wrong. Melkor, later named Morgoth due to how evil he became, was one of the most OP Valar. While the other Valar were specialized in their fields, Eru had made Melkor the most knowledgeable. Yet Morgoth was lonely as he struggled against the void outside of Eru's created lands for the Valar, aka the Timeless Halls. And so he ventured into it looking for the Flame of Eru, also called the Flame Imperishable, without realizing that since the Flame is born of Eru, it rests within him. There's a philosophical lesson there. While Mahal, or the smith, struggles led to the creation of the Duaro, Melkor's ventures into the void cut him from the other Valar and Maya, making him think thoughts that weren't exactly in line with goodness. Is Professor Tolkien commenting on loneliness, and how that can lead to isolation, frustration, or is he vilifying those who go against the grain? Probably the first, considering he writes and loves hobbits who break the peace of the Shire by going on adventures that make them late for dinner. All this came to a head when the Ainur, that is the Valar and Maya, sang the great music in front of Eru. Melkor's discord was such that at first it divided the song into two, which also had Manwe, Melkor's brother, as the correction. But then, when the discord continued, a completely new theme, that of the elves and men, was introduced. Still, the discord remained, corrupting the very fabric of reality. And that's when Eru, to put it mildly, lost it. I mean, Manwe's theme was snuffed out by Melkor's discord, and even elves and men couldn't fully remove it. So, it makes sense that Eru would remind Morgoth of his place and tell him that even his evil would eventually turn to Eru's grace because Melkor was born of Eru. Another a philosophical statement by the professor? Well, this seems to have hints of theology. What do you think, fans? Have you flooded the comments with discourse yet on whether Morgoth was wrong or just different? Here's the thing. Melkor was shamed by Eru's rebuke, but then when Eru Iluvatar revealed that the great music was creation, then he grew interested in Middle-earth and came there. But how powerful was this Valar in Middle-earth? Let's dive right in. How powerful was Morgoth? We've mentioned that Melkor was the most powerful Valar, but how powerful is that exactly? Well, let's find out. See, while the Ainur, who later became the Valar in the world when given physical forms in the world, sought to help the world grow, book fans of the Silmarils know that Melkor sought to control the newly formed world. Some sources say that despite his urge to dominate, Morgoth was only second to Edo himself in terms of power, which meant he could crush mountains and spill seas. While blessed with an enormous ability to alter the world, some sources say that Melkor, even in the form of Morgoth, could never create anything new, unlike Eru or even Aule. Yet, such was his desire for dominion that he spread his evil all throughout Arda, corrupting its very essence to the point that even after he was gone, men were tempted by evil and the elves couldn't enjoy their long lives. This, in turn, made him more powerful. But as we know, eventually he was defeated and his servant Sauron, a corrupted Maiar, became the Dark Lord Frodo and Aragorn at a battle. So, does that mean that at one point Morgoth was weak? Well, yeah, but not so weak that he couldn't curse lineages or cause firestorms and crisis. Hell, he was ruthless enough that even when his power was diminishing, perhaps because he was burnt by holding the Silmarils, he could secure his victory, as shown in the incident with the Ungolian, or the ancestor of the giant spider Shelob we saw Sam Gamgee defeat in Return of the King. And yeah, we'll cover this incident later. Okay, we get it that you get that Melkor was very powerful, but what did he look like? Was he like Sauron's armoured form, or like Aeol the Dark Elf, another mysterious character from Middle-earth whom we have a video on? Why don't we tell you what Melkor looked like while you Google Aeol? Sound good? Hmm. Melkor or Morgoth's Instagram page would contain something that fans love to discuss, aka a big question mark on whether or not the Valar had a physical form, and if he did, what did that look like? So, we at Marvelous Videos ventured into the bowels of the internet to find out what Tolkien fans think of the issue. While many agree that it's likely the character changes when he, uh, to put it in biblical terms, fell, and that he was once fair, what he looks like at the end is a matter of speculation. Initially, he seems to be described as a mountain that waves in the sea, 
and has its head above the clouds, and is clad in ice and crowned with smoke and fire. It's also stated that the light of the eyes of Melkor was like a flame that withers with heat and pierces with a deadly coal. Just like Sauron, he seems to have assumed a fair form for trickery and then lost many of his divine features as he fought the other Valor. In their place, he got a majestic but evil appearance. Others have said that the Professor himself described Melkor as a terrible elf man who was probably dressed like Aeol, the Dark Elf. So we know that his form is a matter of speculation, despite there being some canon evidence. Yet, do we know the same about how big or small Morgoth was? Let's see. Ant-Man or Goliath, the Morgoth version. Well, there is evidence to say that Melkor, despite being of valor, who potentially influenced his appearance, was a Goliath. The main source for this information is his fight with Fingolfin, the brother of Feanor and an ancestor of Galadriel, whose family tree we've looked at in yet another video. Fans have also pointed out that Morgoth or Melkor was described as a mountain whose crown required immense strength to move in the romantic tale of Beren and Luthien. Thus, we can say that, yeah, it is likely that the idea that Melkor is 136 inches true has some canon support. Port. So we know that at one point Morgoth, the Dark Lord of Arda, was the Valor Morgoth. Yeah, we've touched on how he fell from grace, but what really led to his corruption? Perhaps it's time to dive into the sordid histories. The fall of Melkor and the beginning of the rise of Morgoth, a tale of the corruption of a Valor. We've already covered that Morgoth went into the void in search of Eru's flame and introduced discord in the great music, angering Eru, which led to the Valor feeling shame, which might have bred resentment at being disciplined in front of his peers and the Maya. The falling Valor was also curious about Middle-earth, since he sought to dominate the physical plane. This led to the first war among the Valor, and started Melkor down the path that would turn him into Morgoth, the Dark, as we've mentioned. The war happened because Melkor claimed the fields of Arda as his own, and the Valar were shaping the world. Despite this and Morgoth's significant powers, the other Valar decided Manwe, who knew the thought of Eru better than any of the other Valar as their lord. Another aspect that informed this choice was that the other Valar wanted to prep the world for the elves and the men, while Morgoth or Melkor wanted to extend his own desires. And of course, given the nature of Melkor, he pitted himself against his brother and the others in a fit of anger, constantly disrupting their creation efforts, which led to Middle-earth taking a shape that was created due to the struggles. All this stopped when the Valar Tulkas took physical form and his great strength helped the Valar win. After Melkor fled, the Spring of Arda began. But Melkor's evil hadn't halted yet. His true evil did were toward the Eldar, or the Elves, whom he twisted into orcs, despite the Valar's efforts to shelter them in Aman. The Elves who stayed in Middle-earth were already known as the Dark Elves, and Melkor, or Morgoth as he'd later be named, would capture many of them to twist them into orcs. But how did he get his hands on the Elves? Let's see. Melkor's Corruption of the Firstborn of Eru Iluvatar It all began after the Spring of Arda and the arrival of the Elves. Once Melkor fled Arda, the other Valar began shaping the world to welcome the Elves, the first children of Eru. For the same, they created two lamps, perhaps a reference to C.S. Lewis's Narnia, and created a home for the Elves in their light. While the Valar were busy with these, Melkor returned to Middle-earth, and by now he'd gathered a following of corrupted Maiar who were in accordance with his song. They were, of course, Sauron and the Balrogs. Together, they settled in the North most part of Middle-earth, and the fell place was named Utumno by the Dark Valar. And yeah, we know you're wondering how this is related to the Elves and the Orcs. We're getting there, but let's set the scene first. So there, we have it, a great fortress in the north, which Melkor had raised the Iron Hills to defend. Yes, the same Iron Hills the Duara would eventually take back for the free people of Middle-earth, and where Dane Ironfoot will ride into battle from. It's the Iron Hills for me, anyone? Of course, the stench of such evil like Melkor and the Balrogs can't be contained, but before the Valar could take care of Melkor's new hideout, he brought unexpected war to their doors and destroyed the Great Lamps. This led to what Billy Butcher from the Boys would call Scorched Earth, and after they'd taken care of that, the Valar essentially abandoned Middle-earth and instead created Valinor, or the Undying Lands. Why is this important? Well, because now Melkor could do as he pleased on Middle-earth, and by extension, to the Firstborn, who couldn't or didn't heed to the call to Valinor. The Avari, for one, stayed back in Middle-earth. Yep, Legolas's people. And while Melkor was busy expanding his darkness and decay by building fortresses like Angband for Sauron, the other Valar stayed back, afraid that another clash would result in massive destruction, and who wants the children of Eru to wake to that? It's not like Eru had given them a timeline of when the elves would wake, yet this caution would prove to be the Valar's mistake, because a Middle-earth that Melkor had free reign on is also one where he'd find the elves before any of the other Valar. So, does that mean that this is where the Noldor were corrupted? We remain unsure. But while there are many origin stories of the orcs, one does say they were a twisted image of the elves, and since we know Morgoth 
Morgoth couldn't create, only twist, it's likely that he took elves and twisted them. Yet we know for sure that while Melkor might have happened upon the elves first, the other Valar had issued the call for the elves to come to Aman. But once they knew that the firstborn had woken up, Odome and the Valar rent his fortress doors open and chained him. Yet in their haste to capture and contain the evil of Melkor, they forgot to take care of Sauron, the Balrogs, and other felt creatures Melkor had at his disposal. So yeah, while we know Morgoth had plans to corrupt the elves and create the orcs, it's one of the mysteries that surround the Dark Valar. Some sources say that he made them of stone, and others say he bred them in the image of elves after destroying the great lamps. One source, Annals of Aman, says that elves were taken by Melkor, or Morgoth, and twisted into orcs before the Valar chained the Dark Valar. Yet apparently the professor himself asked to alter this idea, since orcs are not elvish. Source, Tolkien Gateway. What do you think, fans? Are orcs twisted elves, or something different? While you debate that in the comments, let's tell you what happens to Morgoth once the other Valar got a hold of him. Ages pass, until one fine day, Melkor is brought before his brother, Manwe. Imagine the scene, the Lord of the Valar and a chained Valar saying he's seen the error of his ways. The Lord of the Valar, Manwe, who's all goodness and free from evil, will of course fall for the ploy crafted by the Dark Lord, unable to see the malice hidden behind those fake repenting eyes of Melkor. And so, the pieces would move into place for the corruption of the Noldor, who Melkor would find useful and gullible enough for his revenge. For the fell Valar would never forget that it was for the sake of protecting the elves that his power was snatched and he was chained. Of course, being evil as he is, Melkor was unable to realize that his power and discord had to be chained for free will and creation to have a chance to bring grace to Edu's thoughts and creations as Edu had said even Melkor's actions would in the end. No, blaming the Elder, Melkor would put up a front, something his loyal servant Sauron would do ages later in the guise of the Lord of Gifts, and Melkor would give advice that would benefit those seeking his counsel, further pulling the wool over Manwe's eyes. Yet Tulkus and Ulmo wouldn't be so easily fooled, and therefore Melkor should have planned for their watchful eyes. Melkor orchestrated a long, slow, and well-thought-out revenge, which included spreading lies among the elves and telling them about the men, whom the other Valar hadn't informed the elves about. This led to speculation amongst the elves that they hadn't been brought to Aman or the Undying Lands for their safety, but so that the race of men could have free reign over Middle-earth, thereby stealing the glory that the elves could have got in that land. Another philosophical lesson here. Eventually, this crisis of faith led the Noldor to rebel and then exile themselves to Middle-earth, heeding the call of Feanor, who, despite fearing and disliking Morgoth, fell for his traps. While Feanor's fall revealed Melkor's true face to the Valar, and Tulkus went to face him, the Dark Lord had already laid the rest of his plan. He faked friendship with Feanor, who refused him, and thus Melkor didn't get his hands on the Silmarils. Would this setback cause Melkor's downfall, though? Of course not. This was because darkness is difficult to defeat, and when Morgoth looked for allies, he chanced upon a giant being who was willing to help evil thrive. And to be honest, there's a reason that there's speculation that Melkor wouldn't have been able to take down the Twin Trees of Valinor without the help of said giant spider. But how did that all pan out, and was it planned or incidental? It's time to take a deep dive and explore that after a quick hydration break, when we remind you to subscribe for more Tolkien content if you haven't already. Morgoth and Ungoliant, a match made in Mordor. When Morgoth was refused entry into Feanor's home, he fled south, where he would meet the monstrous spider that is Ungoliant. Though originally Ungoliant wasn't a spider, that form was taken after Melkor's defeat. While whether their first meeting was planned or not remains up to speculation, but what we do know is this. He promised the being made out of pure darkness that he'd take care of her hunger in return for her helping him destroy the Twin Trees of Light, just as he destroyed the Great Lamps earlier. And so, under the cover of a festival, the two snuck into Aman and Ungoliant drained the trees of their light-containing sap, replacing it with poison, which caused the trees to die in such a grief to descend on Valinor that the professor himself wrote that it couldn't be described in song or tale. In the cover of Ensuing Darkness, Morgoth and Ungoliant snuck away to Feanor's home, killed his father, and stole his prized Silmarils, the only items that could have resorted the light of the trees. And yes, this is the incident Galadriel refers to in the show Rings of Power that has fans divided. After this theft, Morgoth and Ungoliant, using her Cloak of Darkness befuddled the Valar and escaped back to Middle-earth from where Morgoth had been pulled away in chains. And yes, we'll look at how Morgoth was able to hold the Silmarillion despite their burn in a later part of the video. Until then, let's talk of this evil duo. Over time, Morgoth would grow wary of Ungoliant and she'd escape to mate with the great spiders of the south, where she is said to have consumed herself after giving birth to the line that would spawn Shelob. Yet other sources say the two fought when Morgoth refused to give the giant being the Silmarils to quench her hunger, which awoke the Balrogs who helped the Dark Valar drive the creature away. Well, that's the end of Ungolian, and another philosophical lesson about how darkness leads to self-destruction. Oh, have you subscribed yet? You've been here a while now. Get your tea, and let's get on with the video, shall we? For now, we'll talk about another mystery associated with Melkor, or Morgoth, how he managed to hold the Silmarils. 
How could Morgoth steal the Silmarils without the gems injuring him, renamed to Melkor, explained? Did you know Feanor is the one who renamed Melkor to Morgoth? Showing his fall was complete, because that happened. Essentially, after killing Finway, Morgoth escaped to Middle-earth, where he'd set the Silmarils in his crown and wage a war against the elves. Around this time, the men and Duaro would mate, and Morgoth would try and corrupt the men to his ends. While we do know that he'd eventually lose one of the Silmaril to Beren and Luthien, and the rest in the war. But before we look at his defeat, let's solve the mystery of how he could hold the Silmarillion, and why that's an issue in the first place. A quick recap, the Silmarillion, or the gems of Feanor, were gems that Elfsmith had created that had light. His inspiration? The light of the twin trees on Galadriel's hair. They were coveted by Melkor, perhaps because they alone could restore the light of the Valar after the great lamps and the twin trees were destroyed by him. Also, they were a marvel of beauty, so there's that. But why wouldn't Morgoth be able to hold them? Essentially, due to the blessings of Varda, the Silmarils burn the hands of whoever touches them, despite being unworthy of them. Kinda like Thor's hammer. And since Morgoth was evil, and also stealing these, well, he got burnt. Perhaps this is why it's a question of how he was able to hold on to them, because they were burning him till he reached his fortress in Middle-earth. Our speculation? He's just that powerful. Yet this tainted the Silmarils forever, which is why perhaps they were cast in places no one could reach, like the depths of the sea or the sky itself. But uh, that's for another video. For now, let's explore Melkor's echoing scream, shall we? Morgoth's echoing and land-rendering scream. What was it? Why are we talking about his scream? Because it was loud enough to be heard by the Balrogs almost across Middle-earth, from a place in Beleriand all the way to the fortress in Angbad. While the Professor never provides an exact number, we do know it's loud and powerful. It was the cry that the Balrogs heeded to come to Melkor's aid against Ungoliant. The scream that Ungoliant had managed to wreck from Morgoth was so powerful that it left a mark on the land itself and it began to be called Lamoth. That's some powerful lungs right there, eh fans? Well, now that we know that Morgoth was powerful, could scream, and had made enemies of the Noldor and the Valor. Let's see how his end arrives, because he might have defeated the elves in their first war against him, but he does lose sometime. After all, there's no Melkor or Morgoth in Lord of the Rings, just Sauron. The end of the line for Morgoth, or not. Morgoth's tyranny tortured the elves of Middle-earth a lot. The city of Gondolin fell due to his mechanisms for one. His victory was such that he laughed at kinslaying and cared nothing for losing a Silmarillion, but he brought ruin to the elves who had been the cause of his ruin at one point. Eventually, Erendil, the half-elven, would sail to Valinor and beseech the Valar on behalf of the elves and men to aid and pardon them. Moved, they'd come down to take care of Melkor, something he was wholly unprepared for, because just like Voldemort couldn't understand love, Melkor couldn't fathom Passion. The battle was hard and fraught, where initially success greeted the host of Valinor. Despite Melkor unleashing barrages of Balrogs and Orcs, eventually Melkor sent the dragons who overwhelmed even the Valar. No wonder Smaug was called the greatest calamity of the Third Age, and these were even more powerful dragons, such as Ancalagon the Black. The tide turned when Eärendil once again arrived with his flying ship and slew Ancalagon, utterly defeating Melkor. While the Dark Valar tried to escape and sue for peace, the other Valar beat his iron crown in a collar around his neck and banished him to the Timeless Void, a place outside of time and space. Is that it? A being second in power to none but Edu himself, defeated like that? Well, some would say not, because you see, my dear fans, that's a prophecy. Is Melkor ever going to come back, or is that just a myth? Well, not only was Sauron hailed as Melkor returned, but he likely modelled the concept of the One Ring after Melkor, for you see. The Dark Valor had used the whole of Middle-earth to store his essence, and thus some say that he could reach from the Timeless Void and whisper in the eyes of the children of Eru to tempt them to do evil. He is the evil sowed in the hearts of men and elves. But that's not all. There's also some writing published by Christopher Tolkien himself, where the Professor J.R.R. Tolkien hinted that at the end of the days, Melkor would break back into Middle-earth to initiate the Battle of the Battles, where with his death, both men and the children of Hurin, whom he cursed to damnation, would be avenged. So yes, it appears that Middle-earth is just waiting for the return. As the Bard said, something wicked this way comes. Or not. Because right now you have a sweet parting note to look forward to, aka a marvellous review. Well, looks like Melkor was one storied character with a lot going for him. Is he supposed to be Lucifer? That's the question we keep asking. A favoured being falling from the grace of what's essentially the all-father figure in the Tolkien verse could be seen as a metaphor. And he did turn to evil, but Melkor's story has a lot more to it. The Professor seemed to hate the idea of evil for evil's sake, and often showed how evil takes a foothold in the world. Perhaps we should view Melkor as a cautionary character and see what happens when we go too far without considering the impact of our actions on others, especially when the motivation is greed or lust for power. Maybe Melkor could have been the greatest Valar, had he taken a moment to pause and understand what Eru tried to teach him. He was a part of Eru, and the flame imperishable was within Eru itself, as it too was part of the same whole. Not something to be sought outside, or with power, but something that he just had. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if uh, you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Uh, thanks everyone.